Uh, my name is Robin Brown, and I am the coordinator of the 613-819 Black Hub. Yeah, so we work exclusively on issues of systemic anti-black racism. So that's, uh, when I say systemic, that means, so in systems, right? Like uh, a lot of public systems, like governments at all, all three levels, federal, provincial, uh, municipal, so education, that kind of stuff. So we, we're an advocacy group. So we basically, we push those large organizations to make change, right? And, and, and again, specifically on the issue of systemic anti-black racism, right? So, and, and just to be clear, when I say systemic, what I'm talking about is, um, uh, so systemic means, let's say, in a, in, a, in a system like the justice system, right? Systemic anti-black racism leads to like a disproportionate number of black people in jail, right? Systemic anti-black racism in education leads to a disproportionate number of black students who are not graduating, who are being suspended, expelled, the, and streamed into non-academic programming, right? Systemic in the healthcare system means that, like COVID, for example, had a disproportionate impact on black folks. That's what I'm talking about in terms of systemic. We don't focus on, let's say, like hate crimes against black people, right? That, that's, that's not good, all right? But that, that's, not, that's not the, the people who are doing that. that they're, that's, that's, well, <laughs> that, that's not the, again, that's not the systemic kind of stuff we work on, so. Excellent question. <laughs> um, the, the big picture is what we do is, so there's a couple of overall um, kind of, I guess a framework we use, right? So, but one, one is that in order to address any problem, you have to name it, okay? So first is we push these organizations simply just to name, right? Anti-black racism as a thing, because the, the, a lot of what organizations do, especially what, like after George Floyd and stuff, is they'll talk about racism, right? Anti-racism, but they'll stay, they, they still will stay away from actually mentioning anti-black racism, right? <laughs> right, right? So we push these organizations just to name the problem. Then once you name a problem, again, in order to address it, you have to like measure it, right? Meaning you have to get the data on it, right? So we like, we talk about COVID. So the, like we all, in the black community, we all were seeing that like COVID was having a, like a disproportionate impact on black folks, but until the, the folks pushed for the, the, you know, the government and public health to start collecting data, you didn't see, right? So, so that's the thing, so, so, you, you, so you get these organizations to name it first, then you say, you know, okay, that's great, you named it, it's a problem, now we need to measure it, and then once you have the data, then you hold them accountable to actually use that, right, data to, to make change, right? So this is, um, so for example, this happened in, with the, like our local school board, right? So they were, the, the, actually the province of Ontario actually ordered them to start um, collecting data on like race based and race and identity based data, right? So they did, and again, the data showed what a lot of us black folks we already knew, right? That I was like, oh, look, now we have proof that black students are being like disproportionately suspended, uh, expelled, streamed into non academic programs. But we had the data, so now, right, we're pushing the, 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 the school board to, to actually act on that data and make change, right? That, that's the that's really the big picture, and then um, now. <laughs> the question is, how do we push, right? So, I mean, part of it, a big part is simply just like um, exposing this stuff, right? Like, especially once you have the, that's, that's part why the data is so powerful. Once you have the data, right, then you can, then you can go public and go, look at this, look at the data, sure, <laughs> right? So the, um, and then, and even before that, even, even the act of, because, um, you know, different or, or, organizations are at different phases, right, in terms of that, this, what I just described. So even the act, of like requesting the data. Like in, in cases where an organization, let's say, doesn't yet have, have the data, right? Even the act of going in there and, 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 and or, like demanding it and saying, you know, you need to, that in itself is really powerful because the, all the, these organizations, they know what the, that data is gonna show, right? <laughs> right? So um, yeah, so if, if you push for it, get the data and then, you know, uh, keep them accountable because the power of data is a, it's numbers, right? So you can actually, you then have a number to, to, to say, you know, it's like, look, you know, last year your level of discrimination was six. <laughs> you know, we need to get that that or like, like, once you have a number, you have, a, you have, you can. It's, it's, uh, it allows you to set goals, right? right? Without that, you can keep it, um, yeah, vague and, <laughs> and and nothing can change for years, right? Yeah, yeah.
Yeah, no, good question. So, um, what's the second example? Well, uh, okay, let's talk about the police, for example. Okay. So, and this, we'll talk about more about data, right? So there's, so there's, there's what I talked about in terms of, um, you know, pushing the these organizations, like the police included, to to collect data on what's going on, like their use of force and that kind of thing, right? right? But the other thing we've gotten into is we realize that. Um, some some of these organizations, including the, like the, the police especially, have learned they've learned the power of data, and what they're starting to do is to just is essentially to create <laughs> create fake data that backs up like justifies giving them more money. Right, right now, I'll give you a very like a really concrete example of this. Like we discovered, uh, for example, that the auto police force had hired a, a, a professor to do a, like a study on their their latest version of their community policing initiative, which they call the neighborhood resource teams. Okay. Now, we were familiar with this professor because we the, the professor had done a very like problematic study on the the Peel Regional Police's school resource officer program that had police in schools, right? And it was a really flawed study. So we actually went to the police and said, "Hey, you know, uh, <laughs> that professor you hired, she did this really like flawed study, you know." And the police were like, "Yeah, yeah, that's that's why we hired her." So then we're like, "What?" So, so then we filed a complaint with Carlton's Research Ethics Board, right, to say, hey, like, she's doing this problematic research. And they're like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> so then we filed a complaint with, the, she had gotten money from the federal organization called the uh, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, known as SHRC. And we went to SHRC and filed a complaint, and they're like, oh, yeah, so she's okay, right? So this is what I told so this is the, so we exposing this kind of how, this is when I talk about systemic, right? Here we have a situation where the police are hiring a problematic researcher who's supported by the university she works at, who's then supported by the federal, this, this, this is the whole thing, right? So we're, we then work to expose this whole system, working with partners and, and basically bring it to the, to the people who have the power to change, right? Which may be, you know, in this case, the, the minister of, of uh, the, the federal minister who controls the department, who controls Shirk, right? right? Um, that's kind of some of what we do, right? But, you know, also it's, um, Another important thing is to show up at the meetings where of the of the the bodies that control these organizations, right, or that the oversee them. So, for example, for the police, that's that's the Ottawa Police Services Board meeting, right? And I go and I talk there every every month, right? For the school board, it's the uh, the board meetings, right? Like we have, uh, in fact, ones. Uh, in fact, tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow there's a meeting coming up because for the, the, our new board, right? we had an election, a whole bunch of new trustees, right? 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 So I'm gonna. So we're gonna, I'm gonna go there, right, and, and just see what's going on, see what they say. But the, so that's important to do that. And a key thing is to have a, a, a how do you say, to do, have a long-term view, right? <laughs> right? Right, like we've been around since 2017. We're gonna be around for a longer time, right? Like this is, it's a longer view of this you see, right? And that's, when you do that, when you take a longer view and you're, and you're, you're, you're in it for the long haul, that again, I come back to data. That makes the data all, more, all the more powerful because then you can start referring back to like, hey, like look at this. <laughs> you said that nine years ago, right? And look, the data, the data hasn't changed, <laughs> right? Now, in fact, we're seeing that now with the, um, again, we're back, we're back to the auto police, right? So the auto police recently um, released their use of force by race data, okay? So showing how they, and it showed they disproportionately use force on black, indigenous, and Middle Eastern people, right? Their response, this is just like a few months ago. Their response was, oh, <laughs> well, as if to say, oh, that's, that's, oh my God, this is, this is so surprising. This is, you know, we, we're going to do better. Now, nine years ago, right, they, the police were forced to do a study on traffic stops by race. And it showed back then, nine years ago, they disproportionately were stopping black, indig indigenous, and, and Middle Eastern people, right? So, so because of that data, right, we could go and go, hey, you know what? <laughs> We're not really believing you're going to change. Nine years ago, we had this study came out. Right? What nothing? We don't. So we don't believe you that you're going to change, right? So and, and this is so this backs up our calls to like in that in that particular case, like for the police, we um our position is we want to abolish the auto police. Like we want them gone completely. In fact, every police force and jail and the whole bit, right? right? So but and and the, that kind of data helps us to to, to to back up that position. Uh, well, like every organization, obviously we had to move to Zoom, right? Uh, and that actually directly affected us in terms of, so, so one thing I didn't mention in terms of a tactic, 
uh, is um, civil disobedience, right? So that's uh, people who are familiar with that probably they've you know they know they've heard of Martin Luther King, right? Civil disobedience means where you go and you actually break some rules and do a protest, right? So that's the kind of thing that's a very powerful tool for, at uh, uh, at meetings like I just I talked about earlier, where like these meetings of these governing bodies, right? Like the school board meetings, the auto police services board meeting, right? To go in there as activists and to actually like take over the meeting is like a, that's a that's one of the tools you can use. Very difficult to do on Zoom, right? <laughs> because they just they just block you. Or, 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 in fact, impossible, right? You can't do that, right? So, so, so yeah, so that so that took away one of our power, one of our tools, right? And and it's and again, and, it's, and I just want to highlight how important it is that, that the civil disobedience thing, especially for black people, like you know, history kind of shows, right? That the things most of this is more more in the U.S. than in Canada, but there's examples in Canada that unfortunately things tend to only change when like black people burn down white people's stuff or indigenous people start blocking things or so a black person gets killed like george floyd right, right? and we're like hmm so clearly it, it, it's clear in canada to us that that in order for to, for change to happen black people need to get more militant right, right? and that mean and things like civil disobedience is just one example of that right where you basically go and you do something that shows the powers that be that they have pushed black people far enough that we're willing to start breaking rules, right? <laughs> right. So, um, so COVID, yeah. So that was one way. So we couldn't we couldn't go in and take over meetings. Right? We also had to go, yeah, start having Zoom meetings ourselves, and that and that was uh, challenging because you know for for a group like ours, like the in person meeting thing is so important. Like having uh, having people actually in a in a room, uh, having f feeding people <laughs> to get people out right, 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 was key, right? Um, uh, yeah, and then, and then obviously, like, I mean, again, we, we, we're a black focused group, right? And as we, and as you know, COVID was disproportionately affecting black people. So, so for sure, uh, and the fact that we, we focus on, on systemic, like things, right? So a lot of our people were, were just so, um, obviously just so, uh, consumed just dealing with the impact of COVID on their own life. They're trying to get people out to, to focus on systemic systemic things longer term right? we totally understood but people were like man I just, I'm just trying to survive COVID right? I, I don't have time to go right? so um, so that was challenging right but again but, but we're but we're you know I, I, I'm luckily for me I do this full-time right so so I and, 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 and you know I'm middle class I, I you know we were we were not I personally was not affected by the you know we're not affected but you know not impacted so much and not as much as our most of our people by things like that you know, losing my job or hyper like that, right? So, so I could continue, right? And and the and the, and the work and with with some volunteers who who, um, and luckily again, volunteers came and went and did what they could do during the right. But, but that certainly was a big thing. And then then I guess uh, the COVID. Uh, yeah, I guess that that was probably the, the some of the biggest impacts. I'd say yeah yeah. Well, if you, <laughs> okay, so a few things. Well, one is that certainly our, our people, our black folks, the, 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 the resistance that they've shown throughout history to all this, right, all this stuff, slavery, all the oppression, that, 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 all that resistance is an example of resilience, okay? That's one thing that comes to mind. However, the other thing that comes to mind is that it's that term is a term that white people in power use as a tool of, of resistance to change, right? Because they'll say, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because we like when we go in and demand like systemic change, they, they'll be talking about, oh, you know, black people are so resilient. You know, they, 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 they kind of label black people as these noble, resilient people who are there, they, but, but, they, but they don't want to change anything it's fundamentally about the system. <laughs> right, 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 right. It's like, are you people so nice and resilient? You're so, so, you're so glad, you're glad you're resilient. You're like, yeah, well, you're gonna you're gonna change that policy or practice. We're so glad you people are resilient. That that that's what also comes to mind, right? Right, 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 right. right. And um, we see that in action for sure. This kind of, um, in fact, <laughs> the um, yeah. <laughs> One of the places I saw it recently was there is a there is a um, so we have a, um, a fairly well known woman in our community named named in, well, in in Canton named Jean Augustine. Right? Jean Augustine was a, is a 
She was a, uh, the first black woman member of parliament. Um, she's from, from Grenada. She came here as a domestic, uh, domestic uh, wor or worker, I think, and worked as a teacher. Then became the first member of parliament, parliament, first black woman member of parliament. And she was the one who got um, Black History Month recognized uh, by the federal government, right? So, um, so, so great, great for her. The thing is, what the her and this is the, so her story though, right? We see, and I've noticed that the the like, like white folks, including conservatives, use her Jean's Augustine Ms. Augustine's story as this kind of resilience thing, right? And, they, and basically, the story, the way they frame it is, oh, you know, there's some racism, some racism done by some bad people, but if you're resilient. Right? Right, 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 like 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 Jean Augustine, and you you get an education, you work hard, and you're resilient, then you can overcome. And the and the and the main idea there is that there's no systemic like anti-black racism. No, 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 no. It's it's you know there's some done by some few bad people, but again, if you're resilient and you work hard, and, and that and again and again, no no uh, no no critique of of, of um, Miss Augustine. She not it's it's how her story is used, similar to how. Um, like Martin Luther King, right? like, like like white folks use everybody used loves to use Martin Luther King as an example of to justify maintaining the very system of, of white supremacy he fought against, <laughs> right through through various things, and basically they did it by you know the, you know framing him as um, uh, kind of a blanket supporter of just nonviolence and um, protest and, 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 you know, just kind of the idea that, you know, we should all get together or work together. No, like, like, but they, you know, but they ignore some of his more radical positions, like, where, in fact, like the positions he, he, he was, he had, he had begun to take right before he was killed, right, where he was starting to talk about unifying, like, poor people, right, not just black, like, like all the, he started to frame it as a class war, right, and, and that's when he got killed. And so, um, so that, uh, that whole thing, that whole that whole resilience term, is, is part of again how, of how white folks kind of just frame this 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 paternalistic kind of <laughs> yeah notion of black folks as you know resilient. You're so resilient that you 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 in the face of adversity, but we're not going to do anything to change the system that creates that adversity in the first place.